Good afternoon. I'm Commander Anna Kahn, Associate Director for Communication with the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice in the National Center for Environmental Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to welcome you to today's EH Nexus webinar. Our focus today is on National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, and this presentation is Childhood Lead Exposure in the United States, CDC's Role in Prevention, Education, and Surveillance. This is a recorded session. All participants joining us today are in listen-only mode. Closed captions are available for this webinar. Next slide, please. Today's EH Nexus webinar will be available to view on demand shortly after this webinar. You can find the video recording of today's webinar at the CDC EH Nexus webpage at the link displayed on this slide. You may submit questions by emailing us at ehnexus at cdc.gov. Next slide, please. I would now like to welcome our presenters for today's EH Nexus webinar. We're pleased to have with us Dr. Paul Allwood. Dr. Allwood is the branch chief of CDC's National Center for Environmental Health's Lead Poisoning Prevention and Surveillance Branch. I would also like to welcome our second presenter, Ms. Madeline Jones. Ms. Jones is the Health Communication Fellow with CDC's National Center for Environmental Health's Lead Poisoning Prevention and Surveillance Branch. Also joining us to moderate the Q&A portion of today's webinar is Mr. Jonathan Lynch, Deputy Associate Director for Communication in the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Allwood. Dr. Allwood, please proceed. And uh, good day to everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this, this uh, webinar to talk about childhood-led exposure in the United States and CDC's role in prevention, education, and surveillance. Uh, Madeline Jones, who is a health communications fellow with the branch, will be giving most of this presentation. And um, we're really excited to be here and look forward to you know, your participation. And uh, as we get into questions and answers, um, to hearing from you um, and answering your questions to the best of our ability. With that, uh, could you please give us the next slide? So what we're gonna be covering in today's presentation is an introduction to childhood lead exposure. And we're gonna be talking about sources of lead in children's environment. And Madeline will go through and give a description of the populations at a higher risk for lead poisoning or lead exposure. And then we're going to be looking at current trends among children in the United States for lead exposure. And then we'll discuss prevention strategies, and then we'll close out with a discussion of the current initiatives going on at the CDC to enhance lead poisoning prevention and surveillance. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Madeline to go through the rest of the presentation. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for tuning, tuning in. We can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so to begin, I'll just start by answering the question, what is lead exposure? So lead itself is a toxic poisonous metal. Lead exposure occurs when a child comes in contact with lead or lead dust, either by swallowing it or breathing it in, and we'll get more into where that lead comes from later in this presentation. With children, lead exposure often happens when a child puts their hands or other objects that may be contaminated with lead or lead dust into their mouths. Exposure to lead can negatively affect normal body functions when it enters the bloodstream and even low levels of lead can adversely affect the health of children. Next slide, please. The nervous system is the most sensitive organ system for lead exposure in children. These neurological effects are of greatest concern for infants and children because they can result in lifelong declines in brain function. Some well-documented effects of childhood lead exposure include damage to the brain and nervous system, slowed growth and development, learning and behavior problems, and hearing and speech problems. 
Over time, these effects can cause learning difficulties, decreased ability to pay attention, and underperformance in school. Some of these effects may be irreversible. Next slide, please. Lead exposure is especially a concern for children for two reasons. One, the health effects of lead exposure are more harmful to younger children than older children and adults because their bodies are still developing and they are growing so rapidly. And as children are growing so rapidly, they absorb more lead per body size. And second, young children are more likely to be exposed to behavioral factors such as mouthing and crawling. For example, young children tend to put their hands or other objects which may be contaminated with lead into their mouths. Next slide, please. Children are primarily exposed to lead from lead-based paint, lead-contaminated soil, and lead-contaminated drinking water. So lead-based paint was banned for residential use in 1978, and most homes built before this time likely still have some lead paint in them. When the paint cracks and peels, it makes lead paint chips and dust, and children can be exposed to lead when they swallow or breathe them in. Children can be exposed to lead in the soil by touching, breathing, or playing in soil that is contaminated with lead, or when it's brought inside from things like shoes and clothes. Soil is usually contaminated with lead from exterior lead-based paint that falls onto the surrounding soil. It can also be contaminated from industrial sources or car exhaust when near busy roads and highways. And then some water pipes, faucets, and plumbing fixtures may also contain lead, which can get into drinking water. Children may be exposed to lead by drinking water that has been delivered through lead plumbing materials or by drinking formula made with water that contains lead. Next slide, please. In addition to these primary sources of lead, there are several other sources that exist and can be harmful to children. This includes take-home exposure from a parent or caregiver who is exposed to lead at work or through a hobby. Some traditional medicines and cosmetics, when given to the child or used by a parent or someone they spend time some remedies use an, used in Ayurvedic medicine, which may involve traditional and herbal medicines, some of which that have been found to contain lead and other heavy, heavy metals. Candy and candy wrappers, and an example of one is actually pictured right on this slide. Toys, jewelry, antiques, and collectible items. And then ceramic pottery dishes that are glazed with lead. So with these items, lead exposure actually occurs when food is prepared in these dishes. Next slide, please. No safe blood lead level has been identified for children. The amount of lead in the blood is referred to as a blood lead level, which is measured in micrograms of lead per deciliters of blood. When a child is exposed to lead, it is quickly absorbed into the bloodstream and their blood lead level rises. And once a child's exposure to lead stops, the amount of lead in the blood decreases gradually. At CDC, we currently use a blood lead reference value to identify children with blood lead levels higher than most children based on NHANES data. This reference value is a population-based measure. And because of that, it may change as new data emerges and population blood lead levels decline. CDC's current blood lead reference value is listed on our website. And Paul, is there anything you would like to add about this? Yes, Madeline, and, and thanks. I'd just like to emphasize that lead is a poison that hurts at any level. That is why we must prevent kids from becoming exposed in the first place. As we learn more about the effects of lead poisoning, we must accept that primary prevention is key because even very low levels of lead in a child's blood can, have, can result in health effects that can have lifelong consequences. Great, next slide, please. So most children with any lead in their blood have no immediate symptoms. And because of that, a blood test is the easiest way to determine if a child has been exposed to lead. Two types of testing may be used to determine a child's blood lead level. The first type, 
is a capillary test, also known as a finger prick. This test usually is the first step to measure a child's blood lead level. If a, if a finger prick test shows an elevated result, it is usually followed by a second test to confirm. The second type of test that may be used is a venous blood draw, which takes blood from the child's vein. This type of test can take, any, can take a few days to receive results, and it is often used to confirm an elevated blood lead level first capillary test. Based on a child's blood lead test results, healthcare providers can recommend follow-up actions and care. Next slide, please. Here. Okay, look right, right here. Okay. Casey, where's my sticker? Your sticker's coming, okay? You said I get stickers if I do this. And you will get your sticker, Anytime okay? Anytime you're ready. Oh, uh. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Casey, and this is my little sister, Lane. The Centers for Disease Control. CDC. Yeah, the CDC asked us to be in this video. It's about testing kids like us to see how much lead is in our blood. And stickers! Okay. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, there really is no amount of lead that's safe for Lane and me. Even low amounts of lead can harm us. Any amount of lead can harm our future, our IQ, our ability to concentrate, and even the way that we treat other people. And we do not want that. We want stickers! <laughs> so we brought in a nurse and a plebot- plebot- ple Plebotomist. Yeah, plebotomist, what he said, to explain. I've washed my hands, opened the supplies I'm going to need, and put on gloves. Shayla is helping Lane wash her hands. Okay, just stand right here for me. We're not going to dry Lane's hands with anything. She's just going to shake them dry. Okay, Connie, can you shake your hands like this? Good job. And don't touch anything now, sweetie. Just keep your hands up like this, okay? Right. There we go. Okay, so I'm not gonna do anything yet, okay? Can you fold these fingers over for me? Keep this one out. There we go. So these are all the steps you know. Laura is going to use the ring or middle finger. So usually the stick is slightly lateral where the skin may be thinner and maybe less painful. So Laura is massaging the finger gently to get blood flowing. All right. Gonna be a little stick, okay? Good job. Laura's not going to take the first drop of blood. She's just going to let it drop onto this gauze pad. She's not going to wipe. She's just going to let it drop. If you wipe and there's a little lead on the fingertip, then that can get into the first drop. And then that drop may wash whatever's left away. So we can start sampling after that first drop. I'm going to hold my container at about a 10 degree angle to start collecting blood. Now I'll hold my collector straight up and down and let the blood flow in until it fills the container or reaches the indicated level. If the blood isn't flowing well, I'll gently massage the finger. I don't want to excessively squeeze the finger. So, does my sister have too much lead, or what? Oh, honey, I don't know. We have to send it to be tested. We just have to wait. For how long? Oh, just a few days. Okay, so here's the deal. I kind of promised her some stickers. Well, stickers, huh? Okay, well... Awesome! You're probably gonna need enough for me, too. Well, you earned them. Seriously? I like stickers. No! This is my last sheet! Well, we hope you enjoyed that video. This video was originally created for laboratorians um, to provide instruction on how to test children for lead with maximum accuracy. But we just hope that gave you kind of an idea of what a parent can expect when their child receives a blood lead test. Next slide, please. So some children are more likely to be exposed to lead than others. These include children who live in housing built before 1978, children from low-income households and racial and ethnic minority groups, 
who are more likely to live in conditions where there's a greater likelihood of lead exposure. Children who are immigrants, refugees, or recently adopted from outside of the US. Children whose parents or caregivers may be exposed to lead through work or hobbies. It is very important that adults who use lead in their workplace or hobby take precautions to prevent taking it home and exposing their family. Next slide, please. Women who are pregnant are also at a higher risk for lead exposure. If a woman, woman is exposed to lead during her pregnancy, her developing baby can also be exposed. Lead in the blood during pregnancy can cause or can increase the risk for miscarriage, cause the baby to be born too early or too small, hurt the baby's brains, kidneys, and nervous system, and cause the child to have learning or behavior problems. Also, if a woman has been exposed to lead over a long period of time or has a history of having higher lead levels in her blood, the lead stored in her bones can be released into the blood during pregnancy. This means that the level of lead in her blood can start to increase during pregnancy and expose, expose the developing baby to lead. Next slide, please. So now we are going to transition to talk about some current trends in childhood lead exposure. As you can see on this graph, blood lead levels in the US have declined over the past few decades. The data on this graph is actually from a publication that was co-authored by one of our colleagues at CDC. And in this publication, they analyzed NHANES blood lead level data from 1976 to 2016. And what this analysis found is that both the geometric mean blood lead level and estimated prevalence of US children with a blood lead level above five micrograms per deciliter declined substantially between 1976 and 2016. So for example, in the 1976 through 1980 NHANES cycle, it was estimated that 99.8% of children ages one through five had a blood lead level over five micrograms per deciliter. And then fast forward to the 2011 through 2016 cycle, that prevalence is 0.3%. So this decline is a huge public health accomplishment. It's the success of public health and policy interventions that were aimed at protecting kids from lead, like removing lead from gas and banning lead-based paint. But it's important to note that NHANES data are useful to examine trends over time and assess the effectiveness of intervention efforts on a population basis, but they are not generalizable to state or local levels. However, previous analyses indicate that blood lead levels in US children have declined over time as well. This entire publication is available on our website if you would like to read more about it. Next slide, please. Despite the progress made in reducing child blood lead levels, there is still room for improvement. So yes, fewer US children are exposed to lead hazards now than they were 40 years ago, but the remaining children affected by lead exposure are not randomly dispersed throughout the population. They are primarily concentrated in neighborhoods characterized by older homes, lower family income, lower housing values, higher population densities, higher proportion of rental properties, and higher proportions of minority immigrant and refugee residents. Next slide, please. Disparities in blood lead levels also exist. Higher blood lead levels are more prevalent among children from racial and ethnic minority groups, children from low-income households, and children who live in housing built before 1978. Also, children from racial and ethnic minority groups are more likely to live in conditions where there's a greater likelihood of exposure. Some of these inc conditions include poor housing and environmental exposures, such as lead in the air, soil, and water. And Paul, is there anything you would like to add about this? Yes, Madeline, I would like to just point out that the connection between health and social determinants, such as housing, education, and race, ethnicity, is scientifically proven. However, there's still a social narrative that holds that health is largely determined by medical care, genetics, and personal choices. Lead poisoning disproportionately impacts kids from racial and ethnic minority groups and those living in poverty. In addition, if the effects of lead poisoning, such as learning and behavioral problems, will perpetuate inequities and disparities in health, 
wealth and academic attainment. Yes, thank you for adding that. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. So when it comes to protecting children from lead exposure, there still is more work to be done. Millions of children are still exposed to lead in their environments. Additionally, not all children are receiving their required blood lead tests. And because of this, some children exposed to lead are not being identified and connected with the service they need, services they need. And then adverse health, of health and developmental effects are being identified at increasingly lower blood lead levels. So even though the average blood lead level for US children has decreased over time, we're finding out that lower levels of lead in the blood can still be harmful to children. And then lastly, children can now be exposed to lead from multiple sources. In addition to the lead sources, public health interventions have made an effort to eliminate, like lead paint and gasoline. We're finding out children can be exposed to lead from several other sources where they live, learn, and play. Next slide, please. So up on this slide is a quote from a parent of a lead exposed child that tells their family's experience. So this quote is long, but I'm going to read the whole thing because it provides great insight into how severely lead exposure can affect a child. So it says, my son was diagnosed with an elevated blood lead level of 11 micrograms per deciliter when he was a year old. He was tested for ADHD at the age of eight. He exhibited severe symptoms of lead exposure, struggled through school and required a great deal of academic support from the school. He attempted a year and a half of college, but that experience proved too much. He lacks confidence and knows that any career he chooses will require some form of further education. His fear and lack of self-confidence keeps him from moving forward with hopes. Next slide, please. There is good news, and that is that childhood lead exposure from major sources is preventable with an organized effort. The key is to stop children from coming into contact with lead. Parents, healthcare providers, and public health professionals can all take steps to prevent lead exposure before it occurs, pre prevent further exposure if a child has already been exposed, and mitigate the effects on the child's health. Next slide, please. On this slide are some steps parents, caregivers, and others can take to protect their family from the effects of lead exposure. So these include learning about the common sources of lead so they can be aware of any possible lead hazards in their child's environment. Testing their home for lead, lead-based paint, and lead-contaminated water, especially if it was built before 1978. And those who rent should ask their landlord to have these tests done also includes being safe when conducting home renovations and repairs. So some of these activities like sanding and scraping paint if the house was built before 1978 can release lead dust. So if you are planning any renovations, make sure your contractor is certified by the Environmental Protection Agency. Taking steps to stay healthy like eating a balanced diet and practicing basic hygiene activities like regularly washing hands, removing shoes before entering the house, and cleaning up dust around the house can also help prevent lead exposure in the home. And then lastly, talking to the child's healthcare provider about getting a blood lead test. As we said, a blood test is the easiest way to determine if a child has been exposed to lead. Next slide, please. Healthcare providers also play a key role in helping to prevent lead exposure among children. Some things healthcare providers can do include learning about the causes, symptoms, and effects of childhood lead exposure so they can better inform their patients and identify children who could be exposed to lead. Talking to their patients and families about lead exposure to increase awareness. Ensuring children under the age of six receive required blood lead tests. And then helping connect exposed children to recommended services. The effects of lead exposure can be permanent, but if they are families and healthcare providers can take steps to prevent further exposure and reduce the damage to ch their child's health. Next slide, please. 
Public health professionals also play an essential role in helping to prevent lead exposure. To prevent and reduce lead exposure in their communities, public health professionals can learn about the hazards and risk factors in their community. For example, is there a large amount of housing in the area? Are there industrial sources in the area that may be affecting some residents? Is the is a large population that is at higher risk for lead exposure? All of this and more information is available on our website. Public health professionals can also educate their community members and colleagues on childhood lead exposure to create, create awareness and a sense of urgency to prevent lead exposure. Another key strategy is to partner with organizations in their community. Possible partners include emergency medical services, the fire department, poison control centers, hospitals, clinics, and urgent cares, and pedi pediatric practices. And lastly, just acting as a resource for parents and healthcare providers can, can help to prevent exposure and educate those in your community. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to transition to discuss CDC's role in preventing childhood lead exposure. So at the CDC, our Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program's vision is to eliminate childhood lead poisoning as a public health problem. Our mission is to reduce blood lead levels in children and differences in average risk based on race and social class. Paul, would you like to add anything about this? Uh, yes, Madeline, I would like to say that the vision of eliminating childhood lead poisoning as a public health problem is a very bold vision, but it's a very necessary vision. And it is entirely achievable, but will require massive collaboration on a multi-sectoral basis. I'd also like to say the mission is deeply rooted in the principles of health equity and environmental justice, which are major priorities of the CDC. Health equity is achieved when all people have the opportunity to achieve the highest level of health that they're capable of achieving. Achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with focused and ongoing efforts to address avoidable inequalities and historical and, and contemporary injustices. Health equity means reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and, their determinant, and its determinants that adversely affect groups that have been excluded or marginalized. Examples of historically excluded or marginalized groups include racial and ethnic minorities and people living in poverty. Thank you. Next slide, please. On this slide are, is our program's core strategies. These include strengthening blood lead testing and reporting, surveillance, linkages of lead exposed children to recommended services, and targeted population-based interventions. Next slide, please. So we support lead poisoning prevention activities nationwide. Our program's activities focus on supporting state and local health departments in childhood lead poisoning prevention activities, educating key audiences, conducting research, providing technical expertise to other agencies and partners, and supporting state and local programs. This map shows all of the state and local public health agencies that we supported in our last funding cycle. Paul, is there anything you would like to add about our upcoming funding cycle? Yes, I would like to say uh, that we are very pleased to have so many partners at the state and local levels working to prevent childhood lead poisoning. And we thank them for uh, decades of great partnerships. We are currently finalizing cooperative agreements with a total of 62 state and local health departments, including Puerto Rico. This is a significant expansion of CDC's previous lead poisoning prevention and surveillance awards. However, our available budget did not allow us to fund all approved applications we received. We forecasted spending $20 million in fiscal year 21 and spent over 24 million. In general, state programs were funded for component A, 
which supports surveillance and other activities that state programs are better equipped to carry out. And local health departments were funded for component B, which creates better opportunities for local community-based solutions that will drive engagement, build partnerships, and help us achieve health equity. Great. Next slide, please. On this slide are examples of some of the successes our funded programs have accomplished. So they have achieved many successes in addressing childhood lead exposure in their communities. And these are just a handful of the numerous successes achieved across all of the programs we fund. So all of our recipient success stories will soon be available on our website where you can read more about all of this. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of exciting things happening for childhood lead poisoning prevention at CDC. First off, this year actually marks 30 years that CDC has been supporting state and local childhood lead poisoning prevention programs. So to commemorate this milestone, we are engaging in several new activities and projects throughout this year. So the name of this anniversary is continuing our commitment to childhood lead exposure. Next slide, please. And as Paul mentioned, this year is also the beginning of a new funding cycle. Um, as Paul described, we received a record setting number of applicants for this funding cycle. And also for the first time, eligibility for this funding opportunity was expanded to include public entities such as territories, in addition to the state and local governments. Next slide, please. CDC recently formed the Lead Exposure and Prevention Advisory Committee, or LEPAC, as we refer to it. So the LEPAC consists of 15 federal and non-federal experts in the fields of epidemiology, toxicology, pediatrics, early child education, and much more. So listed on this slide are some of this committee's responsibilities, and all of these are listed on our website in greater detail. But most recently, the LEPAC formed a work group to review CDC's current blood lead reference value and provide recommendations to CDC's National Center for Environmental Health on whether to revise it. Next slide, please. And we are also preparing to publish a supplemental issue with the American Journal of Public Health. So we invite any interested authors to submit manuscripts on the topic of lead exposure prevention and mitigation. The deadline for submission is January 30th, 2022, and the anticipated publication date is September 15th, 2022. The title of this supplement will be called Ubiquitous Lead, Risks, Prevention, Mitigations, Mitigation Programs, and Emerging Sources of Lead Exposure. Next slide, please. And then our branch is also in the process of de developing a new lead poisoning prevention training center which will be a great educational resource for public health professionals. This training center will be available to public health department staff and other jurisdictional partners tasked with reducing lead exposure in communities. It will offer continuing education credits and we are hoping to launch the first portion of this training center this October. Next slide, please. Lastly, Please mark your calendars for the last full week of October, which is the annual National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week. It is hosted by CDC, HUD, and the EPA. And throughout the week, we will all be engaging in several activities to heighten awareness of lead exposure, provide resources, and encourage preventative actions. This is a great opportunity to raise awareness about lead exposure at the community level and learn from others working in the fields. So please keep an eye on our website where we will regularly be posting updates about it. Next slide, please. In addition, um, and more information on the topics covered in today's presentation, you can visit our website to find state and local information, data and statistics, a library of publications, guidelines and policy tools, um, some FAQs, laboratory tips and guidance, and communication materials available for distribution. All of these resources and more can be found on the link on this page. Next slide, please. 
And then on this slide are some lead exposure prevention resources from our federal partners. This includes information about home testing, finding a certified contractor, products recalled for lead content, and adult lead exposure. Next slide, please. And so before we go into the Q&A portion of this webinar, we just want to reiterate a few things. So first, no safe blood lead level for children has been identified, and even low levels of lead in the blood have been shown to affect IQ, ability to pay attention, and academic achievement. Second, protecting children from lead exposure is important to lifelong good health. Individuals, public health professionals, and healthcare pro providers each play a key role in preventing childhood lead exposure. And lastly, at CDC, we are committed to eliminating childhood lead exposure as a public health problem. Next slide, please. Yep, so we thank you all for tuning in and joining us this afternoon. Um, before we end, we would like to thank our colleagues at CDC's Division of Environmental Science and Practice our funded state and local childhood lead poisoning prevention programs and our federal and other partners. So now I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Thank you so much. You guys really, um, we're seeing very enthusiastic comments in the uh, chat window. So I would encourage all the panelists to open that up and look at it. And um, <clears throat> we've gotten a number of questions. Some of the questions were kind of specific. So I encouraged them to email us at ehnexus at cdc.gov. We can follow up with very specific questions or questions that may be a little bit off the focus of this webinar through that, uh, through that mechanism. Um, so the first question I'm going to read to you comes from Crystal Quijada. And Crystal is asking, uh, has any research been done on capillary, capillary testing and the percentage of how many false positives result from capillary testing. And I don't necessarily expect you to know the exact number off the top of your head, but if you can address sort of the need for follow-up testing after a positive capillary test and how often that's an issue. Okay, thank you for, thanks for the question, uh, Crystal. Um, there, there has been plenty of uh, research looking at the, the relative, um, accuracy and reliability of capillary, capillary tests. Um, I do not have a, have a specific reference to share with you now, but I, I do encourage you to um, take a look at our, at our website. We have, you know, uh, there's a discussion on our website about the, um, the, necess the need for follow-up testing with capillary results. And I would encourage you to please check that out. Um, <clears throat> the next question um, comes from Margie Coons, who asks, when will CDC lower the blood lead reference value to reflect more in Haines data, more recent in Haines data? Thanks, Margie. Uh, as I think you may be aware, the, the LEPAC voted in May of this year to recommend that the CDC lower the, the BLRV in keeping with the, the current data from the NHANES survey. That recommendation has been forwarded to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and, and, a, and a decision is pending. So we're not able to give an exact timetable for when that re recommendation would be implemented prior to the, the Secretary's decision. So we'll, but we will be communicating as soon as we're able um, the exact plan for, for any any implementation of this update to the BLRV. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> the next question is coming from Cecile Truong, who is asking a question about use of the LCA2 test to get a more rapid result, I guess, for immediate or near immediate turnarounds in doctor's offices. Can you speak to that, Paul? Yes, um, and thank you for the question. I think the LCA, that's lead care too. This is one of the, the point of care uh, test modalities that's available. And it is you know, valuable in the sense that it allows um, physicians to, to carry out testing and provide results and this sort of follow up um, during an office visit versus you know, having to 
um, you know, have patients go to, to a laboratory or, you know, um, there's de uh, delays in getting results using other lead testing methods. So, you know, the, the lead care methodology is, is, you know, available and it's, it has been proven to be a very useful tool in the, in the toolbox for, for ensuring that our kids are tested for, for lead on a regular basis as required. So this next question is going to be near and dear to your heart, Paul. Um, Kayla Wilson is asking if we have any advice or strategies for lead poisoning in populations that are low income and in rural areas that may not have many services available to them. All right. So, you know, there we are working with state and local partners and, and they, you know, depending upon the the area that this question comes from, I would recommend uh, reaching out to your your state or your local public health department to you know help identify some of the the approaches that might be more more specific for your um, for your particular situation. So, you know, I, I strongly recommend going to, you know, reaching out to your state and local health, state and our local health department for um, some guidance on how you might approach that situation. Okay. We also have some questions that uh, were collected previously, and there's a couple of those that um, I think we wanted to make sure we got to. So I want to ask that uh, now if we can. Um, Many people have asked, how was lead poisoning treated? And I was wondering if we could go ahead and address that topic, Paul. I know it's not, this is not a clinical webinar, but to the extent that we can explain it to, um, to our viewers. Sure. Um, so, you know, the, the child's health provider is the best resource for addressing issues related to, to their health. Um, if a child has lead in their blood, their doctor, you know, or the provider may recommend actions such as finding and removing lead from, from the home, you know, feeding the child a diet that is high in iron and calcium, connecting the child to early educational services, follow up blood screen, screening and, and other things. Um, but I just like to, I just like to stress that early intervention is key to reducing long-term effects. And at very high levels of exposure, um, your doctor or your child's doctor may recommend additional testing, x-rays or chelation therapy or other things. But, you know, as I said, the, the best resource, you know, for how to treat or how to manage um, lead exposure in a child would be the child's provider. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> We have received multiple comments, uh, both here and previously, uh, prior to the start of the webinar, um, asking about how adults can work with uh, lead to prevent, um, who, who work with lead can prevent exposing their children, uh, so-called take-home exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can take this question. Sure, Madeline. Um, yeah, so adults who work in certain industries or engage in certain hobbies uh, may be exposed to lead and can unknowingly bring it into the home and expose their families to lead. And on our website, we actually have an extensive list of all the jobs and hobbies that could possibly involve lead exposure, which I encourage um, anyone to visit and take a look at. But um, some steps to prevent take-home exposure would be um, changing into clean clothing before returning home from work. Um, keeping the work activity tools outside of the house, so not bringing those inside, um, and then washing work clothes separately from the rest of the family's clothes. Um, and so, like I said, more information is available on our website about this. Okay, um, thank you. And mm -hmm. the next question uh, is from an anonymous attendee who asks, what tools are available to families who wish to test lead and paint local soil, water, and just in general, home testing. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh, go ahead, Paul, please go you ahead. Can answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I was just gonna say, so for testing um, 
lead in the house, especially when it comes to paint, um, you can get a lead paint inspection or a risk assessment um, to find out whether there is lead in the home. Um, a lead paint inspection will tell you um, the lead content of painted surface or painted structural parts like doors, walls, windows of the home. Um, but a risk assessment will tell you if there are any serious lead hazards such as peeling paint or lead dust and what action should be taken to address those hazards. So um, your best resource for information on this would be the state or local health department um, for information on lead inspection services in the area. Um, and if you rent, um, you should talk to your landlord about getting these tests done. Great, okay. And um, <clears throat> the next question uh, from, uh, comes from Taffany Huang, and it's also a topic that we have um, seen come in prior as well. Um, can you speak to the prevention efforts uh, for uh, immigrants and refugees who may have had um, sort of greater lead exposure and can you speak to that as a as a concern in general yes um so uh we do um recognize that lead poisoning can be a significant problem with um members of the immigrant refugee populations. And, um, you know, one way that we, you know, we, we partner very actively with um, our refugee health colleagues here at the CDC to ensure that, you know, refugees, refugee, refugee children are receiving uh, lead screening. And, and if they're screened to have um, levels of blood lead above our reference value, we recommend, you know, necessary follow-up, you know, and including education and connection to services that um, that we believe can minimize the the uh, the consequences of of lead lead poisoning in our immigrant populations. Would also say that, um, you know, while there are you know, we the United States has has taken very significant steps to reduce um, lead the possibility or the sources of lead exposure, including, like Madeline mentioned, you know, various policy initiatives that you know have removed lead from from paint and from gasoline and other things. We we know that that across the world this is not necessarily true, and that there are you know lots of places where the opportunity to be exposed to lead or the problem of childhood lead exposure is still very, very difficult and persistent. So we do take, take steps to ensure that refugees are screened and when they're screened that they are provided the appropriate, um, you know, uh, connections to services that can help. Um, Paul, a question that's a good follow up to this. Um, why is lead a persistent problem? Why isn't it just banned everywhere? So, you know, the answer to that is that, you know, even though there have been restrictions in, uh, on lead and gasoline, paint and consumer products for many dec decades now, um, lead contamination still lingers. Uh, lead and gasoline was used in cars until 1992, as I think many people are aware. You know, so soils near busy roads and highways may still contain lead residue from uh, lead and gasoline you know, deposited there before you know, lead was banned from gasoline. There's also a problem that older homes built before 1978 still likely contain some lead-based paint. You know, exterior lead paint on old, older homes and buildings can flake off and pollute the surrounding soils. There are also millions of U.S. homes that still get their water delivered through lead-based pipes. Lead is still also used industrially and, and is also used in aviation fuel, which can contaminate the air and soil near factories, and airports, and, and thereby expose communities. Exposure also still occurs through non-traditional sources of lead in some imported spices, candies, and folk remedies, and also in toys and cosmetics, as um, Madeline pointed out during our presentation. Okay, um, <clears throat> we received a, a 
kind of a specific clinical question about testing uh, pregnant women for lead and it that question may be a little bit too specific for this webinar, but can you speak generally to whether it is safe to test pregnant women and the fetus for lead? Madeline, do you, would you like to yeah, take I can one? take this one. Yeah, so um, obviously a healthcare prof professional should be this person's primary resource when it comes to um, this topic, but um, what we can say is that blood lead testing of all pregnant women in the United States is not recommended. Um, instead, CDC recommends blood lead testing for pregnant women um, for lead if they have an identified risk factor for lead exposure, such as living near a point source of lead, um, maybe an occupational exposure or um, recent immigration from a country where lead contamination was higher. Um, but blood lead testing should be performed if a single risk factor is identif identified at any point during the pregnancy. Um, and we do have some more details of this available on our website. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> The next question, um, <clears throat> can lead be absorbed by touching surfaces of any materials that are in good condition, um, but maybe they're painted with lead paint? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's one that gets asked quite a lot. Um, if lead-based paint is intact and remains in good condition, then the lead-based paint is usually not a problem. However, there is a potential for exposure to lead-contaminated dust if the lead-based paint starts to peel or crack, or if it gets you know, ground down from friction um, on surfaces such as in, in windows, windowsills, doors, and door frames, and during repair or renovation activities. Young children do, do, do tend to put their hands or other objects, which may be contaminated with lead dust into their mouths. Because of this, extreme caution should be taken around items and surfaces coated with lead paint in a child's environment. The safest thing to do is keep these items out of reach. Great, okay. We're, um, we're getting some questions about the recording and uh, the answer is, uh, I've posted in the chat the location where the recording will be found in the next few days. Uh, we just have to process it and uh, get it, get, uh, like high level closed captioning done on it. And then uh, we post it on our website. Um, so our next question is related to um, children showering and bathing. Is it safe for a child to shower or bathe in water that may contain lead? And I know this, I know that during some situations where leaded pipes have been a concern in certain municipalities, this question was very frequent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so bathing and showering is safe um, for children, but children are primarily exposed to lead through inhalation and ingestion. So dermal exposure, which is exposure through the skin is less common. So because of that, we, we will say that bathing and showering is safe in lead contaminated water. Okay, that's good to know. And um, we're running close on time here. So I'm gonna close off with one final question that I think um, is really good to address. If, if blood lead levels have declined tremendously over the past few decades, why is there still so much effort being put into lead poisoning prevention? So um, I can take that one too. So Millions of children are still exposed to lead in their environments and significant disparities exist by race and income as we've discussed in this um, presentation. So for example, higher blood lead levels are much more prevalent among non-Hispanic black children, children from lower income households and children who live in housing built before 1978. Um, and children affected by lead exposure are primarily concentrated in neighborhoods um, characterized um, by older homes, lower family incomes, lower housing values, um, higher proportions of rental properties, and then higher proportions of minority, immigrant, and refugee residents. Um, and then another thing is that adverse health and developmental effects are being identified at increasingly lower blood lead levels. So um, as we've reiterated, there is no safe level of lead for children. Um, 
So with that, even, um, even though the average blood lead levels in children have decreased substantially over the past few dec decades, lower levels of lead in the blood can still negatively affect a child's IQ and behavior. Thank you, Mr. Lynch, for moderating the Q&A portion of today's presentation. This concludes our webinar. Thank you for joining us and a special thanks to our presenters, Dr. Allwood and Ms. Jones. If you have additional questions, you may email them to ehnexus at cdc.gov. Again, thank you for joining us for today's EH Nexus webinar and have a great day.